science is something to do with inspiration. I may say science, and you may say, huh. but no. Science, if we try and think of an inspiring scientist, it's pretty easy, pretty easy. Stephen Hawking. Now, Stephen Hawking visits the Perimeter Institute here in Ontario about once a year. So if you get a chance to go see a talk by Stephen Hawking, do so. You'll enjoy it. It's an interesting experience. What you'll find is that his talks start out very simple. You might even be a little bored at the beginning. And then at some point, he'll be talking right at your level. And you'll be saying, got it, got it, yep, do good. And then you'll be struggling to keep up. You'll be saying, wait, wait, what? And then you'll be lost. <laughs> this is normal. This is normal. This happens to everyone. When I was at university, I saw Stephen Hawking give a talk. I walked out. I heard professors behind me saying, did you understand this last slide? No, I was totally lost. It's normal. And the point is, don't be intimidated. People you think are perceived to be at a higher level than you often just have more experience. Uh, Stephen lost me in his talks earlier as an undergraduate. Then he loses me now as a professor. But he still loses me somewhere. And it's not just his talks. It's scientific talks in general. I'm going to talk to you today about our universe. And I'm going to talk pretty fast. And I'm going to introduce to you to some concepts that you probably haven't seen before and that are pretty mind-bending. And you'll probably be lost at some point. And that's fine. That's OK. When I go hear a scientific talk, I usually hear things I don't understand. But I've used my experience. My insight now is, OK, if I don't understand something, I think of a question about it. And it, Come up and see me after break. I hope you'll take the chance to think of some questions and come talk to me if you have them. So science and imagination. Science is a creative use of imagination, of mathematics, and computing. Science is creative. It isn't just plugging numbers in. You have to think about, well, why are you doing this? What's the next step? Where is your imagination going to take you? And imagination is more important than knowledge, according to no less than Einstein. And that's because without imagination, there would be no new knowledge. If we think we know everything, we don't imagine anything else, and we don't get anywhere. So imagining what's going on in the universe around us without preconceptions, without thinking that we know everything, that, uh, that we understand everything, has led to some unexpected discoveries about our universe over the last century and a bit. And I'm going to talk today briefly about some aspects of two of those discoveries, about special relativity and black holes. So Einstein's special theory of relativity, there's a couple of things we need to understand or take as given in order to talk about relativity. And one is that no information can travel faster than light. Right? Let's just take that as a given. And the other thing we need is that light always travels at the speed of light, which, as shorthand, we just call c. Now, that sounds a little silly. Light always travels at the speed of light. Duh. <laughs> but that leads to a very key insight. And what this means is that everyone in the universe sees light travel at that speed, no matter how fast they themselves are moving. So if I'm standing here and light whizzes past me, it's going at the speed of light. If I'm in a rocket ship traveling at 90% of the speed of light, I still see that light move past me at the speed of light, no matter how fast I'm moving. That leads to effects that are very different than what we see in everyday life, because the speed of light is so fast, 300,000 kilometers per second. That's how fast light travels. And in everyday life, we get nowhere near that speed. So we don't notice any of these strange effects. But if we did move that fast in everyday life, we'd notice these effects, and they would be every day. They would be unremarkable. So what are some of these remarkable effects? Well, here's one. Time dilation. Time runs slower for someone moving relative to you. You're all sitting there, uh, sitting down. And relative to you, if I move around, time is actually moving slower for me than it is for you. Now, we would only notice that if I was moving at close to the speed of light. But this effect, time dilation, all we need to understand it is imagination and a bit of geometry. So let's use our imagination and a little bit of geometry and talk about time dilation. 
So we'll do what Einstein called in German a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. Meet Lise. Lise has a laser clock. Lise's laser clock fires a pulse of light shown by a triangle. This laser pulse goes up, hits a mirror, tick, and comes back down, all traveling at the speed of light. And when the pulse reaches the bottom, we can launch another one. This works as a clock. You could build a clock using lasers and keep track of time like this. To reach the mirror at the top of the clock, the light pulse has to travel some distance h for height, and it travels that distance at the speed c. So we can use this to measure time. If you have been, uh, if you've traveled 100 kilometers in a car going 100 kilometers an hour, you've been on the road for an hour. And we can use the distance traveled by light divided by the speed of light to measure time. Lee sees her clock tick once in a time that for shorthand we'll call lowercase t, which is equal to h over c. And we'll come back to this later. So now meet Hans. Hans has an identical laser clock to Lee's. And when Lee's and Hans are not moving with respect to each other, their clocks keep the same time tick and back down. So, when they're not moving, they agree their clocks show the same time. But, as indicated by these two wheels at the bottom of each of these, Lise and Hans are standing on rocket trains. <laughs> this is why this is a thought experiment. We don't have the technology to build rockets that could uh, move us at a considerable fraction of the speed of light, and even if we did, it probably wouldn't be very safe. So let's stick with our thought experiment for now. What will happen when Hans is moving? for example. So, let's see. When Hans is moving, his light pulse has to travel farther to reach the mirror. Both moving at the speed of light, Lisa's pulse just goes straight up, Hans has to move, pulse has to move to the right, it takes longer for his light pulse to reach the mirror. So when Lee sees Hans moving, she still sees his laser pulse move at the speed of light, but from her point of view, his clock's laser pulse has to take longer, has to travel farther, excuse me, to reach the mirror. So Lee sees Hans' clock run slow. From her point of view, time itself is slowed down for Hans. And we can use the Pythagorean theorem to work out exactly this relationship. So again, let's review. Lee sees her clock tick once in a time t, given by distance over speed of light. The light in Hans's clock has to travel a longer distance, let's call it d, to reach its mirror. Therefore, Lee sees Hans's clock tick more slowly, once in a longer time, let's call it t prime. And we can use the Pythagorean theorem to relate t prime and t. If you're not familiar with the Pythagorean theorem, ask your math teacher later. But here I've just drawn arrows, or sorry, drawn lines, same distance. So I'm going to show that one more time. At this time, both light pulses have traveled the same distance, but Hans's light pulse has to travel a little farther. And if, again, if you're not familiar with the Pythagorean theorem, don't worry about it. But if you are, you can look at this equation and realize that the faster Hans moves, the more slowly his clock appears to run from Lisa's point of view. The faster he travels close to the speed of light, the slower time appears to run for him. And this effect is called time dilation. Lee sees her clock tick once every t seconds. She sees Hans's clock tick slower every t prime seconds. Lee sees time running slower for Hans. Now we've done this using laser clocks just because it's easy to explain. But if Hans has a watch, Lise would see that watch running slower as well. If he had a little monitor on recording his heartbeat, Lise would see his heartbeat slow down. If he was speaking, Lise would hear him speak more slowly. Now, here's where it gets even stranger. From Hans's point of view, he's standing still, and Lise is the one who's moving. Hans is standing there right next to his laser clock. It's working normally for him. Lise is the one who's moving. So Hans sees time running normally for himself, and he sees time running slower for Lise, not faster. He's standing still. To him, Lise is moving. To him, it's her who has time running more slowly. 
So let's see this in an animation. Let's see this relativity at work. There's Hans, now he's standing still. His laser pulse goes straight up at the speed of light. But Lisa's laser pulse takes longer to reach her laser clock. Hans sees Lisa's clock run slow. This is relativity. It's the motion of someone relative to you that determines how their time appears to run from your point of view. So this is one implication of Einstein's special theory of relativity. There are a few others. But both Lies and Hans agree time itself runs slower for someone who is moving relative to you. And the faster, the closer they're moving to the speed of light, the slower time appears to run. The slower their time appears to run. If Lies and Hans were to turn their laser clocks horizontally, they could find about, out about length contraction. And if they triggered light pulses as they zip past each other, they could use those to figure out that they don't always agree on simultaneity, which is just a word meaning which things occur at the same time. Now, if I take a cup and drop it, they will both agree that the cup was dropped before it hit the ground. But events that occur in distant places, they'll disagree on which one happened first. So these are all implications that we can work out just more geometry. We're not going to do that today. Instead, we're just going to use the fact that light is the universe's ultimate speed limit to infer the existence of black holes. So let's take a look at that. Let's talk about gravity and black holes. Black holes are what I study, so I find them particularly interesting. If I toss something up, Earth's gravity pulls it back down. If I toss something up faster, it'll go farther away from Earth before coming back down. And I'm not going to try it, because I'm not going to risk uh, breaking this in the morning session. Now, if I could, however, toss this up, Fast enough, it would escape Earth's, velocity, Earth, escape Earth's gravity completely. If I could toss it up faster than what we call Earth's escape velocity, which is just over 11 kilometers per second, per second. That's pretty fast, and that's how fast rockets have to move to launch a spacecraft to out beyond Earth to explore our solar system. 11 kilometers per second is pretty fast. Now, we won't derive the equation for this, but it turns out that for any object, an object's escape velocity, to escape its gravity, times itself, is equal to 2 times g. And g is just a number you can look up, like 60 minutes in an hour, <laughs> times the object's mass divided by its radius. And the radius is just the, roughly the distance from the center of an object to its surface. So if we have the Earth, and we added mass to the Earth, the Earth's gravity would increase. And we would have to throw something up faster to get it to escape Earth's gravity. And if we were to take the Earth and shrink it, I'm personally pretty attached to the Earth, so let's not do that. Let's, let's take Venus. <laughs> let's take Venus, same gravity as Earth, pretty much. Take Venus and compress it down. If we shrink it, then when we stand on the surface of Venus, we're closer to its center. And we would feel a stronger gravity. And if we compressed Venus to roughly the size of a golf ball, we'd run into a problem. Because nothing can have a velocity greater than the speed of light. But if you take any object and make it small enough, you create an object where the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. If I take any object and make its radius small enough, then the escape velocity will eventually become greater than the speed of light. And if you do that, if you take Venus and crush it down to the size of a golf ball, you've created a black hole. Black holes are not theoretical. They are real objects. They really exist. And a black hole is just any object with an escape velocity faster than the speed of light. If you're inside a black hole, you'd have to throw something up faster than the speed of light for it to escape. Can't do that. So nothing can escape a black hole. And the boundary at which the escape velocity reaches the speed of light is called the event horizon. Objects which fall in past the event horizon, objects which cross the event horizon can never escape. Because to do so, they need to travel faster than light, and you can't do that, at least not in our universe. But matter can orbit outside a black hole just fine. If the, sudden, if the sun suddenly became a black hole, that would be bad news for Earth, but Earth's orbit 
would remain the same. Gravity far away from the black hole would be the same. But matter can orbit outside the event horizon if it moves fast enough. And what happens then? What happens if you take matter next to other matter and start it moving past each other very fast? You know the answer. It heats up. Matter orbiting a black hole will heat up just due to friction. And that friction can make matter hotter than the surface of the sun over an area larger than Earth's orbit around the sun. So imagine going outside and seeing the entire sky as bright as the sun. That'll give you an idea of how much energy can be put out by matter spiraling into black holes. And we call those objects quasars. And quasars are what I study. Because quasars inspire me. Maybe they'll inspire you. Maybe you'll find something else. But I personally find quasars fascinating, and they inspire me. So I've built up my insight about quasars over time. I can tell when a quasar is unusual. When I find an unusual quasar, I'm intrigued. I want to know why. I want to think about it. I want to use my imagination to figure out what's going on. So this is an illustration that I came up with to try and understand some unusual quasars I found recently while looking for something else. Found them completely by accident. No one expected these kind of objects would exist. So I started thinking about them. I published a paper. I find this interesting. It may be that you'll find interest in science. It may be that you'll find interest in something else. But whatever you find interest in, use your imagination. Build your insight. And you'll find yourself inspired. And if you apply that inspiration, you'll find that every insight will make a difference. Maybe sometimes a big difference, sometimes a small difference, but it will always make a difference. So using your insight, being unafraid to say, well, wait a minute, what about this? You'll find that that's one way you can make a difference. So I wish you inspiration. And whatever your career, especially if you go into science, you may be a little concerned. You like science, but maybe you got lost. That's OK. No less than Einstein once said, don't worry about your problems in mathematics. I can assure you mine are still greater. <laughs> Whatever you go into, you'll challenge yourself just like Einstein did, and you'll find yourself inspired. Thank you.